What's up, Internet? Welcome to episode one of Gamer Chat. So, for episode one, I've got a really special guest for you guys. He's the host of a show called Boundary Break on YouTube, and I'm really excited to get into this chat. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the show. Um, it might sound familiar to some of you. That's because it is a spiritual successor to a show called We The Gamer Cast by Sean Capri. I talked to Sean and I asked him about uh, carrying on with that style of show and uh, I figured I'll put my spin on it and we'll go from there. But just like we the GamerCast, if you'd like to be on the show, make sure you reach out to me either down in the comments here or on Twitter. But without further ado, let's jump into the conversation with Mr. She Says. <laughs> So, she says, hello, uh, you want to kind of tell people who you are, maybe if they don't know uh, or haven't seen what you've done? Sure. I, I basically run a show called Boundary Break, where we take the camera anywhere we want uh, to try to find new discoveries as well as explain developer techniques. Um, a lot of games that I've covered up to this point have been kind of like a 50-50 divide between Nintendo and everything else. <laughs> so. <laughs> awesome. So that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you guys haven't seen his videos, they are epic. Like, there's been so many cool things. Like, dude, so you, like, popped up in, like, my recommended feed, and I, like binge watched you like this whole last week <laughs> like there's so many like cool things that i've learned like i guess i never really put two and two together how like when they're developing a game like how that all works so it's really cool to get to see what's outside of what you're seeing yeah you wouldn't think that to be as much to see as there there is but yeah. um yeah after like over 100 episodes kind of you find out that there's a lot of things that they decide that oh yeah they're never gonna see it so why don't we just leave this here and <laughs> works out great for me cool so i guess my first question i guess the most important question is uh how like how did you start gaming i guess um like where did it all start oh start gaming i yeah well when i was about five years old um a family friend who was a little more well off financially than my parents were uh came by the house during christmas and uh gave me and my brother a nintendo entertainment system the one that comes with the duck hunt slash mario brothers combo and a huge passion for gaming and fortunately i had a lot of friends in my local area that um had more games than me so i managed to get exposed to the greats uh like chrono trigger and um you know gargoyles quest and all that stuff uh that goes outside of the super mario worlds and sonic mm. the hedgehogs and um that kind of just shaped me into a hobbyist of video games because i was able to sample the best there is to to play and it became a you know just a everyday part of my life to try to find the best games and just play it as like my number one hobby i'd say that video games now at this point are more important to me than television or movies definitely that's awesome so have you primarily been a nintendo fan then since you've um you know got into gaming and like it's been part of your life so i guess is nintendo like your main go-to well what's funny is um i started off with the nes and then our family was introduced to the sega genesis uh -huh. so so I was on the Genesis side, although my friends did have their own Super Nintendo, so I got to play that once in a while. Um, then we wanted a PlayStation and Nintendo 64 uh, for Christmas, and my parents at this point realized that me and my brother fight over everything. So instead <laughs> of giving us both, they got us both a Nintendo 64 of our own. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we ended up having an N64 generation at our house, and... Um, then from there, I think that's when 
the the Nintendo roots started to take hold, and like you know when it came to that third third generation with GameCube, PlayStation Two, mm-hmm. and Xbox, the answer was clear. I had to play Super Smash Brothers Melee, so I got a GameCube, and for a long time did not have a place. Eventually, over time, I got the PlayStation Two. Never got the Xbox, and then you know from there I had to get every Nintendo console. But I was eclectic. I also picked up the 360, PlayStation Three. PlayStation 4, you know, and I I do a lot of PC gaming as well. Nice. Dude, that sounds like like almost identical to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I've been I grew up on the the Super Nintendo and then uh you know, went back and got the NES and played that and then, you know, like my primary console's always been Nintendo, but then as I got older and had my own money, I jumped in and, you know, bought the other consoles, too, just because even if it was just for, like, one or two games, I, like, wanted to have it. But, Absolutely, uh, yeah. So, what would you say your, like, all-time favorite game is? See, that's tough. You know, back <laughs> in the day, and I say it's tough because back in the day, I could give you a definitive answer, and then mm-hmm. over time, I'd realize, like, oh, well, this game's great for these reasons. And uh, as as I get... As I'm at this age in my life, I've realized that like there's so many good reasons to pick a favorite game out of many. So it's like, um, for a point in time, I would have said Earthbound. Perfect journey game. Uh, mm-hmm. You get to start off at, with humble beginnings, and it all kind of uh, accumulates to a grand adventure by tearjerker too so it's nice it's a good feeling it's a good immersive game um but then chrono trigger has a a better narrative spoken to you um and i like that game quite a bit um but then there's just amazing 2d like side scrolling games like super metroid and i guess i'm kind of falling into the super nintendo uh family they Mm -hmm. feel like they kind of like pinnacled uh their 2d quality gaming at that point Though there wasn't as many great games as I would say the NES, but um, say that that's it holds a, a near and dear place in my heart for the wealth of content for the subsistence version, uh, combined with the uh, emotional narrative that it has. But see, that's the tough part, though. Picking just <laughs> one, I can't give it to you, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I have a question though on Earthbound. Did you play that one? when you were a kid, like back on the original SNES? Oh, yeah. I got to play it before uh, Ness's appearance on Super Smash Brothers on the Nintendo That's 64. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, it didn't have as much weight um, back then to me, mm-hmm. but um, it, you know, once Ness was important enough for the very first Super Smash Brothers, I would go back and, uh, you know, and see, you know, why the heck he stood, the you know, as tall as Link and Mario at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, over time, I really grew to appreciate Earthbound and sites like Starman.net only uh, bolstered <laughs> that <laughs> fandom that I had for the game. Um, and, I, again, I would probably argue that that fan site may have given me too much of a bias towards the game. But I do think that it is a incredibly important one, one that is worthy of a site like Starman.net. Yeah, definitely. I'm assuming um, you're a huge fan as well. Is oh yeah, that... I love Earthbound. <laughs> I wasn't ever, I wasn't ever lucky enough to have the cart, but like, I remember walking through Kmart and seeing that big box <laughs> in like the oh, the bargain yeah. bin, and knowing what I know now, I kick myself for not like begging for that game because you could get the big, you know, the box with the game and the manual and everything on sale. Like they're just trying to get rid of them all for like. 30 bucks and (laughs) now if you have that whole thing still in the cellophane it's worth a fortune oh i know it's insane and i i never i never got to see one in a store but i always saw the box that my rental store had uh Mm -hmm. it was like it was placed on top of the aisles they were like half aisles yeah so if you were an adult person it would probably be up to your chest height um and that was the only box in the rental store that was placed on top of the the half aisle So, like, it seemed really, really important, you know, when you'd walk through the rental store. It was just crazy seeing that big, huge box. Like, um, but like I said, I never, I had to rent it too. um, Or I rented it and played it when I was young. 
and then you know when i played it as older like when i got older i played it and it's crazy like how that it was just a fun game when i was a kid and then when i got older seeing all the undertones in it and everything it's like i don't know it's like a very wide game there's a lot of things that i wasn't expecting when i played it when i got older for sure i i mean again as a kid a lot of the creepy music and stuff like that really stuck out to me um but as an adult it's again it's like the perfect journey game and uh you know it's hard to identify that that's a reason why it's so great yeah. um when you're a kid but when you're like an adult and you're so jaded by everything mm -hmm. you go back to earth earthbound and you see like wow how did it how did such an unconventional concept but also uh, such a, a novel concept too, which is that it has like Americana as the theme as, as a, uh, for an RPG. Like, how did we never have anything like this before or after? You know, it's crazy. Definitely. And that's like the coolest part, even now today is it's so unique. I mean, with its, you know, it's a, it's a, a regular, it's an RPG, but the, uh, the theme that they used was so unique and still unique to today is I think why I still have such a, a big attraction to that game. I wish I that like they it. would make like, even if they just took that one and remade it in HD, that would be so cool. <laughs> I, uh, I've been a huge proponent of Nintendo remaking the game with clay models. The ones that you oh. see in the, the player's well, guide. I think that would be fantastic. That would be epic. You wouldn't even need uh, Mr. I think it's actually accurately pronounced Itui or something like that. Mm -hmm. Even though I like to say a toy. Um, I believe you don't even need his involvement at that point. You already have the, the skeletons. You have the bones of the game mm -hmm. shown within the, the original Super Nintendo title. And then all you have to do is just kind of like reimagine that with clay aesthetic. Um, and like, you know, a three 360 camera and stuff like that. I would love that. That would be so awesome. <laughs> so moving from there how how did you get into youtube i well first of all uh the first youtube video i ever saw that really stuck out to me i mean i never really was a avid youtube watcher at the time but um i was on game facts and people were talking about james rolf the angry video game nerd mm -hmm. and um he was the first person to make me realize that uh meaningful produced content can be a thing on YouTube as a platform. And I think a lot of us get inspired by him or um, say like some future YouTubers that were also inspired by him um, to do the same thing, right? And I had YouTube channels in the past. They never took off. Um, part of it was I didn't have the technology uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to keep up. Um, also, I just didn't have uh, a sense or a know-how to kind of present myself in a way that would be entertaining to others. Um, and, uh, but I kept trying. That's the big thing is that I, there was a lot of failures along the way. And um, then one day uh, I was just like going through um, a way to try to play punch out on the computer with my, my mouse. I wanted to play you know, the, I wanted to be able to use the IR pointer with my mouse, and that was the point. And mm -hmm. I was going for the options to see what exactly I could do to make that possible. And then I, see, I just see an option that says free camera, and I fig I didn't know what that really meant at the time, to be honest with you. And so I clicked that option, and then I found out that what it does is it moves the camera completely outside of its intended boundaries. And um, I thought that was fascinating. I'd never personally seen anything quite like that. Um, on YouTube or anything else. And so uh, I took a clip from Punch-Out of King Hippo from another, another angle. And um, someone had told me, like, one of the very few followers I had, because this was uh, an existing channel that I was working on, and I mm -hmm. had, like, a subscriber base of 3,000 people or something like that. Um, one of those initial fans said that they shared it on Reddit, which I thought was cool. I never had really gone to Reddit before. And um, uh, I guess... From there, it got managed to reach the top of the page, which again, I had no frame of reference of what that really meant. Yeah. Um, but then uh, the next day, one of my favorite sites at the time to visit, which was GoNintendo.com, um, did an article about it, which for the record, I've been trying to get videos to be shared on GoNintendo for the longest time, yeah. and none of those would ever get picked up. But then this one raw clip of, uh, of Punch-Out 
made it on the website. And then from there, I knew that I had uh, an original show idea that I had to make um, and make it right. That's awesome. Like, it's funny how, like, things just line up like that and just work out. And, like, it's the stuff that you never think is going to take off. Like, the the thing that you're not thinking about all of a sudden is, like, boom. <laughs> like, people are, like, really interested in that. No, and absolutely. The, the boundary break thing, it's such a cool idea, too. And like you said, there's not a lot of it anywhere you don't really see, but um, it's such a you cool know, concept. Yeah. I, you know, uh, before before Boundary Break as a show, there, like, if you were to try to find a similar show, it didn't exist. It There was um, the closest thing you could find was that somebody um, was doing a Silent Hill series in which they would exclusively try to go through Silent Hill 2 and 3 and try to look at things from different angles, and that was it. And they didn't have a great working camera, um, and uh, it wasn't like a, f a structured show by any means. They were just kind of like doing a let's play and then mm -hmm. like moving the camera, and that's the closest thing you could find to uh, produce content involving a free camera. Yeah. Um, Outside of that, you know, there's just people that uh, were demonstrating it with no commentary or anything like that. But, like, I made very, very sure. I was like, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I don't want to, you know, follow this idea if someone has already done it before. And literally nobody had. And, uh, you know, if you find any content that's similar to, my, to mine now these days, those are people that came afterwards. Yeah. That's awesome. So, do you mind talking about the the technical side of it? Like, I guess, like, my biggest thing when I'm watching is how it works, I guess. Especially, yeah. like, with older games and stuff like that. Like, how how do, like, do is there special software you use for the camera stuff? Or how does it all work? So, um, I, can't, I can't answer too many questions about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Only because, um, you know, the show tries yeah. to... Uh, you know, legitimate game sales and by getting too much into the technicality of it, you know, it could, it could hurt game sales. And so that's essentially mm -hmm. why I don't. Um, and again, that's important. It's always been important to me for just moral reasons, but, uh, also <laughs> it's worked out great because now like game developers like to work with the show. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And so I, I try not to betray the trust of, of those individuals by ever getting too, de too detailed, but, yeah. um, let's say, for example, we talk about, um, let's say, Bioshock, for example. There, mm -hmm. there are people who do uh, modify software to make that happen. And probably the most common um, way you'll see it on my show is if it's a PC game, um, there's a software available that uh, looks for certain values and you can like tag those values and those values are attached to the camera. And so like... Um, let's say that the camera's current position is like numerical value 4,775. Well, if you subtract that value, the camera's going to pan backwards. And, you know, so like then you program a controller to say like, okay, if I push down, it's going to lower the value. And then if I push forward, it's going to raise the value. And then from there you have a control of a camera that can move backwards, forwards, left and right, search all around and uh, pan down and up. So it gets a bit complicated to actually make it happen, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's essentially how it's, how it's done. So uh, do you ever, is it, is it difficult? Like um, getting the footage you need? It can be, um, you know, so, sometimes like the most ideal situation is that uh, I can, immediately snap back to any scene that I want. Um, I can make this, the camera work in any cutscene. Um, I can freeze a cutscene and like move the camera around during those cutscenes. And uh, if a cutscene has multiple camera angles, I want it to be so that my camera will stay in that one position no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, now there, there can be complications. Sometimes you're not so lucky. So, uh, it's impossible to find certain values to, to the camera. Um, Sometimes uh, there's no way to freeze the game at all. Uh, sometimes there's no way to immediately snap back to a certain scene. So it's kind of like you have this one shot to get the most interesting footage of this scene. Um, and you may not be able to go back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that becomes stressful. Um, and, it's, and it's just different from game to game, really. 
and again, the least ideal situation would be um, the the camera just doesn't behave like it doesn't want to stay in the same spot. Um, you know, it may not. It may be very jittery. Like there's all sorts of problems that can happen with the show. But it's come to this point now where there's so many options for episodes that people are eager to see. Yeah. That I simply just will not work with the finicky, difficult cameras for games and. Because at a certain point, it'll probably be that that camera can be shaped into a much better camera for the show. Cool. So, has there is there is there a game that you really want to do a boundary break on, but haven't been able to? Yeah, um, Gears of War is usually one that immediately comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's there's a PC release, but for whatever reason, it's very difficult to get the camera values, and uh, it doesn't work in cutscenes. I believe. I believe that was an issue as well. And so it's it's like a half baked camera. Yeah. That, that I wouldn't want to cover an episode for. Um, the I think a large portion of the time it's like modern console games that are really difficult. Um, you know, I I would, and then there's also games where. Um, I'd love to cover them, but I just know that the audience wouldn't take to it. They wouldn't like, you know, watch it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, like the last guardian, it would be one that I'd love to cover mm -hmm. for a personal, uh, reason. I really enjoyed the game, but it, the game was panned. And, uh, as far as I can recall, the sales were rather low as well, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and so by proxy, if I was to make a video on it, there would be a very small audience that would be interested in watching it. Mm -hmm. Um, which one or which game has been your favorite to cover? I uh, it's always the games that I really enjoy, right? My favorite mm -hmm. games. Uh, so Earthbound was, was a blast. Um, Super Smash Brothers is always a great time because the camera is so strict, yeah. right? So um, to be able to see that from other angles is is fascinating to me. Um, the mother, th the mother three one that I'm working on right now is great. It has so much content that is out of bounds that the players never meant to see. And that's like, those are always like the, um, the, you know, the, I'm just I was trying to think of a metaphor, but it's, those are always the best episodes where, um, it's, it's less on the, Hey, this is how developers do this sort of thing. And more of the wow, I cannot believe that this is out of bounds and it's <laughs> yeah. never shown by the player. And Mother 3 as an episode has a ton of that sort of content. Mm -hmm. So those, like, um, your Smash Bros. Melee episode is one of my favorite. Um, there's so much to see in that. Like, it's crazy how much, like you said, is, like, out of bounds. Stuff that they put so much effort into, but you have a restricted camera, so you can't always like really get a good look at some of that stuff. It's crazy how much how much they put into things like that, like no, just really, the background. I appreciate that, and uh, you know, I I really need to remake that episode because it's one of the older ones. So mm -hmm. the commentary is like really really cringy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I I'm glad that you watched it, and I agree. There's a lot of great content in that particular episode. It definitely is worthy of like getting modernized so that it's uh it's it's more rewatchable <laughs> <laughs> um oh there was something else i was gonna say about that one i don't remember i should have took better notes <laughs> um, <laughs> i guess is there outside of boundary break anything that you'd like to do going in like in the future or anything that you've worked on or anything like that well, I think any creator on YouTube could probably back this up, unless you're completely focused on money, and mm -hmm. they they exist. Um, won't name any <laughs> names, of course. I wouldn't want to start any drama. But um, you know, I think any person who's creatively driven on this platform can tell you that they wish they could just do anything that they want. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, of of course, I get those feelings as well. There's a part of me that. Um, never forgets what the audience is there for and my job my goal at the end of the day is to entertain people and if my calling is to do the boundary break show that's what i mostly will do and then i creatively try to come up with other ideas that 
are in the same vein as as boundary break so it's not too jarring and this isn't too much of a contrast um but that being said i i would love to do video game reviews i'd love to do skit comedy you know like i uh i may not be i I wouldn't go as far as say as uh i'm a uh exceptional creative person but i do at at heart have a passion for being creative you know and like it would be great to expand and kind of like challenge that creativity um with all sorts of different types of videos but yeah i would say like um if I could, if I could literally get away with making whatever and people would enjoy it, I, I would probably do a couple of game reviews here and there and stuff like that. Cool. Like, yeah. And I, I know that feeling like it's so, it's so like, it's hard to like pinpoint, like there's so many things that I'd like to do and, um, you know, not having a huge following has allowed us, um, because, uh, quest for pixels is me and uh to uh two of my friends and you know we've kind of been all over the place because we've been working on quest for pixels for the last two years and it was it started out as me and tony uh the other original founder of it we just started a podcast because we wanted to talk about games and uh it's kind of grown from there but you know we've kind of stepped all over the place like streaming and um game reviews and stuff like that until uh we kind of narrowed our focus i guess but uh like this show um this is the first episode and uh it was it's actually the successor to another show that i loved and uh i talked to the um the original creator and it was called we the gamer cast and the whole concept was just talk to strangers from youtube basically or from the internet (laughs) and it it uh it was an amazing show and he just recently stopped doing it and he's one of my good friends and i you know asked him you know would you mind if i picked up the torch you know and carried it forward and he kind of helped me get everything set up for this so but nice man you know it's 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 hard to you know, stay focused on like one thing when I have all these other things going through my head. But, uh, what would be, um, do you have any advice for people that are trying to get into like the gaming scene or that want to create content, but you know, um, what would be your advice to them? Uh, I would say the, the best advice I can give is either be incredibly, charismatic so charismatic that you set yourself apart from others uh and you could you could literally take any idea um that exists previously and you kind of shape it into your own Mm -hmm. because um you're doing it in a way that is so charming and different that people have to come to you right so it's like you're not you're not another watch mojo top 10 like you do something wildly different from them and it like it it sticks it it leaves an impression on people's minds um the other and i would argue people say that i'm both i i don't see it but like (laughs) the other is to uh come up with pioneer an idea um be the first to to come up with something that no one else is doing but people enjoy you know and i think if you really pay attention to what people are uh, gravitating towards more these days I would say it's information, you know, if you can provide some kind of information that no one else has provided, um, people in the gaming community have a high value for it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, and I'm not saying that as just solely as the boundary break guy, um, but summoning salt who does the world record progression series that has lit up on fire. Like people absolutely love hearing about the world of speed running and he's the, at the time, he was pretty much the only person uh, serving out this whole world that people were unaware of in a digestible format. Um, you know, because before that, uh, people in the speedrunning community were very, like, it, I'm, I, obviously it wasn't intentional, but they get so complicated and so uh, within their own community that it becomes, they've almost created a, uh, a a barrier of entry there's a lot of jargon and things you need to kind of realize and there's a lot of uh time you have to sit through just to kind of understand it all and appreciate it all whereas 
summoning salt gives you a 15 to 40 minute video and kind of walks you through it uh in a way that anybody can understand and uh th that is something that you know that people really really enjoyed and cared about and so he's now a huge youtuber uh who has his own set of uh imitators uh because of such a an exceptional idea mm -hmm. and uh yeah, I mean, like, you know, Digital Gaming is another one that's an older example, yeah. but like, yeah, I mean, that's, he, they, they were the first to do it. So they, um, they mastered the craft and they also found a lot of success through it. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I would say again, to, to travel back, I would say, make sure you come up with, uh, an original idea that people would like to see something that you would like to see, hmm. uh, is a great a barometer for whether or not you should even roll with the idea. But um, I'm seeing a trend in which information involving games is uh, more important to the gaming community than ever before. Cool. So, um, how, how was the transition to going um, from like part-time YouTube to full-time YouTube? And are you, I guess, are you still um, working full-time on YouTube? Oh, yeah. 100% <laughs> of working full-time. I, I wouldn't be able to do RPG episodes if, if I was still doing it part-time. Yeah. Um, yeah it, first of all, the transition was great. Um, it was a little scary at first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I went from a job that had a lot of potential, it, it, like it, I was working side by side with the CEO of the company uh, at by the end of it all. And that's kind of like, that's a lot to walk away from. But what happened was he was one of those people that never complimented a person. They like, it was uh, either you're in trouble or you're not in trouble. And that's my way of saying you're doing a good job. And uh, he was really trying to break me in at a time in which hundreds of people on YouTube were, um, so appreciative of everything that I was doing and the money, uh, was starting to balance out to be about the same as the job that I currently had. So it, it the answer felt clear at the time. It was like, you know, I come into this job, I waste hours of my life that I could be using towards boundary break to take uh, emotional abuse from some guy, you know, it's yeah. like, even if I don't make as much money doing YouTube, wouldn't I rather do something that I'm passionate about, you know, at the end of the day? Um, but the, the, the leap was somewhat easy because, the, again, the, the money started being about the same on YouTube as it was with the office job. And so I had to think to myself, um, how, how much potential does this channel have if I invest all of my time into it? And so I left and I started doing uh, YouTube. And then the adpocalypse happened almost immediately after. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that was pretty stressful. Um, and I made a video asking people if they would help me on Patreon. And I, I would also, you guys can do whatever you want in regards to this subject. But, uh, if you were to ask me, I would say, wait until there is a genuine moment in which you need support from Patreon before mm -hmm. asking, because I think people, are more eager to get behind um, a cause than simply just do because they're fans, you know? Yep. Um, and I just have, it was that point in time where it was like, okay, the, the money that you would normally get from ads are much, much lower now all of a sudden. Yeah. And I just left my job. Can you guys help me out? So, um, Patreon really helped me out in those early, early few months. And then the progress of the channel just kept getting better and better and better. And now it's to a point where, um, I am more successful than my parents were, which is what they would have wanted more than anything in the world. So, you know, I feel, <laughs> I feel great at this point, you know? So speaking of your parents, like what was their initial thought about it? Like oh, you doing this full time because like the, uh, I know I've tried to explain to my mom, like the potential <laughs> and why I want to do it. But, um, 
it's always a hard thing to bring up. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you find your success, sh- your mom will totally understand at that point. Yeah. Um, it's so it's funny. My parents have never been the discouraging type. They've always been supportive. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my mom, uh, may she rest in peace, uh, managed to share a story with me during a period in which I was actually successful at YouTube. And um, the way she would tell the story is uh, when I first came up with Boundary Break as an idea and I was like starting to see the the episode shared on Go Nintendo and stuff like that, I came out into the living room and I said to my, fa- my parents, um, that now this might seem a little bit crazy now, but... I, I really think that this uh, this YouTube channel that I have going on this show is going to blow up. It's going to be huge. And um, I I may at some point decide to quit my job so that I can do this full time. And she said um, <laughs> in her head, she was like, what the heck? Can I curse on this show? <laughs> yeah, <you can. laughs> she was like, what the hell is he talking about? Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? You want to do it so you can make little silly videos on the internet. Um, (laughs) But when she saw, I I think it was the play button. I believe it was the play button that uh, when that first came in, it became tangible for her. She was like, she saw an accolade and she was like, oh my God, like they care about you this much and you have how many subscribers? And (laughs) and then um, again, she was also around for when I had... uh, my interview with Nintendo Force published in their magazine. And, uh, I, you know, the magazines came in and I showed her, I was like, yeah, there I am. There's my, uh, you know, my logo and everything. And this is me in the interview. And she was like, oh my God, you know, and she <laughs> like, she's like, can I take one of these to my office and show my coworkers? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was at that point that my parents totally understood that like my life has changed drastically and for the better. Mm-hmm. And they they were so proud, uh, but yes, it started off with them being like, "Uh huh, okay, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that," you know. <laughs> uh, no, that's cool. Um, you know, I kind of had so, I, um, how do I put it? So when I when I'd asked you, honestly, I was thinking, "Oh, he's you know he's too big, he probably won't." But I was like, "I just, I have to throw it out there because I'd love to talk to him." And when you messaged me back, I called my wife and I was like, oh, my God, you're never going to believe this. <laughs> and she's like, what's going on? And I, I told her about because I had even told her that I was going to be doing this new show. And when I told her, she's like, well, really? He's actually going to he's actually going to talk to you. I was like, well, thanks. <laughs> but uh, no, it's 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 definitely cool when when things work out and um you know, I'm just a small fry and I didn't, I honestly didn't think that you would. So, uh, no, no I, I love helping, you know, small people in the community. It's, it's kind of, it's one of the things that I try not to ever forget about. Like in a time when I was starting out with the show, it, there was so many YouTubers out there that were just Kings serving Kings mm-hmm. is the expression where, um, they won't talk to you, acknowledge you if you can't help them in any sort of way. Right. Yeah. Um, and I always, I, I was always resentful of that fact. And, um, I kind of kept it in my head. Like if I make it big, I don't want to completely abandon all the people that start out. I don't gain anything from it, but, um, you know, I, it means a lot to the person that, that I, you know, extend myself to, you know? So I'm very happy to do it. Awesome. Well, and like I said, I, I I really appreciate it, you know, and it's cool getting to talk to you. It's like, it's like almost meeting a movie star, I guess. Um, (laughs) Well, I'll just let you, I don't feel that way whatsoever, but thank you. (laughs) Um, no, it's, it's definitely cool. And you know, this, the, the reason why I, you know, I wanted to do this show is it's just, it's cool getting to hear from, um, from you and, uh, the uh that was one of the reasons why i started listening to um the guy that had done this before me and uh it's just cool to hear from different people big or small and you know that's that's the the big driving factor of this is anybody can be on the show um big small whoever so uh 
I was really excited to uh, have someone like you, you know, for episode one. It's so cool. <laughs> I'm honored. I'm, I'm really glad that I could, again, that I don't know who's going to be next. It better be Ego Raptor or something. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, on, on that topic, so you, so you said that uh, James Rolfe, or Angry Video Game Nerd, for people who yeah. don't know who that is, um, he was a big, um, I guess, inspiration? I yeah, guess and I actually got to you. meet him pretty recently too. Really? Yeah. That's what I was just gonna ask you. Is uh, yeah, have to, you ever uh, thought about reaching out to him? Oh, I, I don't. I don't know if I'll ever be able to like collab with him in any sort of way. I'd love to. Um, but I mean, uh, I'd love to have him on this show. Like that oh, would be would? that would be I, a dream come true. <laughs> I know. He well, so um, I I was fortunate enough to be invited to a YouTube gaming party mm-hmm. when I went to PAX East and. Uh, a lot of people that I look up to um, happen to be there. Like Gerard the Completionist, Angry Video Game Nerd, uh, Aaron Hansen was there. Um, uh, Jack Septicai was there as well. Uh, Vine Sauce Vinny, uh, A Plus Start from Son of a Glitch, Beta 64. A lot, a lot of people. And I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anybody that also uh, meant a lot to me. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, I, I didn't get to speak to him too much. Um, unfortunately, uh, the way it goes is you kind of gravitate towards the people you're comfortable talking to. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I did manage to shake his hand. I, you know, I explained to him that, uh, the same thing that many, many people have told him in his life, which is that he's an inspiration. Yeah. Um, he's a pioneer, um, and that he needs to be respected <laughs> as such. Oh yeah. Um, like he's such, a, I think he's an inspiration for a lot of people. Like, um, he was, he was probably the first, like, video gamer that i saw on the internet um yeah same back in like (laughs) like before youtube in the early days of youtube um i that's like he's the one person that sticks in my head and just his content is amazing everything he does like some things like even like the movie stuff it's um i'm not like a real big movie buff but he's introduced me to a lot of things and just i you know he's funny (laughs) i love i love the stuff that he does Oh, so yeah. so do you live in an area where it's it's easy to like um like those bigger things are accessible uh you mean like events and stuff like that Is yeah that yeah to? yeah uh yeah i'm near a major city so yeah. it's it's not too bad um i personally i am uh well i'm a bit of an introvert so it's it's tough to like <laughs> uh do like these large social events and stuff like that um but I try to make it make the effort like once a year, maybe twice a year. Uh, this year, I'm probably going to be about three to four cons because cool. only because yeah, they, they were willing to fly me out, and I'm thinking to myself like, honestly, uh, I I'd love to be able to say by the end of my life that I've been a well traveled person, and so like being invited out to Texas and uh, Portland, you know, and stuff like that that that's a good opportunity that I probably shouldn't pass up because of my shortcomings as a social person. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I was like doing this show. I was so ner- like, I was nervous to talk to you. <laughs> I'm an introvert too. <laughs> like, um, and I thought about the show as like, it's like that, that thought that, you know, if you don't do it, then you're never going to get comfortable talking to people. And yeah, uh, exactly. I'm hoping that's going to be a byproduct of doing it as often as I am. Like, I hope mm-hmm. I can just get on a stage and I don't have the shakes or anything like that anymore. <laughs> it just becomes second nature for me. I, I still like I've done two panels now and both times uh, my nerves were wrecking me. But yeah. thankfully, I, I wasn't skipping too many beats while talking or anything like that. And that's what's most important, I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if I was asked to stand up and walk around, you'd see me, I'd be like trembling. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, that's, that's my hope too, is that eventually it all just, just becomes second nature. And I, I, I see that in James, I, he seems a lot more comfortable in social situations now. And I remember seeing footage of him early on trying to, you know, engage with people and it was difficult for him. But like, uh, I think he even said himself in an interview that like nowadays he's so, it's so easy for him. So uh, I just, I have faith that it'll probably be the same for me. Yeah. So that's like one thing that I always do. Like I told, uh, my friend, I was like, go to a YouTuber that you love and try to go back as far as you can in their video feed. I say, because it'll make you so much more comfortable when you're afraid to hit publish. Oh, absolutely, Brad. Yeah. Throw, throw like as many as you can. And like the, um, 
Now, not everybody feels this way, but I do say um, find the constructive criticism in all negative comments. Mm -hmm. um, if you see like enough comments where people are just like, oh, this is terrible, you know, like in I'm placing it nicely. Um, just think like, okay, there's a, a weird flux of people that don't seem to like this. Let me try to figure out, identify what went wrong and uh, go back and do another video with all that information in mind. Um, you know, for me, it was, uh, I was, there was a point in time where I was trying to work in too many jokes and the show just doesn't call for extended humor. It just doesn't. And, uh, I recognized that through the comments and stopped doing it. Uh, I mean, like there is still like a tinge of humor. If, if I can like say something that's mildly comedic and then before you can even stop to think about it, we're already talking about something else. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I feel, I feel like that's okay. But like if I do like a long run out joke, it needs to land and it's not <laughs> going to be appropriate for the show to begin with. So it's, you know, I learned that through reading comments yeah. and um, there's lots of examples just like that, that help shape the show into what it is. And again, I wouldn't have really come to those conclusions unless I read the comments. So my advice to people is, you know, kind of grow a thick skin and, um, <laughs> subject yourself to to the to the occasional bad comment and deliberate whether or not it was uh, a comment that you should address in in a certain like towards your content. That's awesome. Like, um, that's that's kind of my thought too. Is um, you know, you're never gonna get better unless you know you take the the criticism and run with it and like i like to make fun of myself because i figure you know what if i do it then i'm not going to be bothered by other people but uh so i always try like to work in you know the my cuts like the stuff like at the end of my video i like to put um like the bloopers i guess of like i like to show that i'm not comfortable doing this and and then in that you know people will um feel more comfortable watching your stuff i guess by you showing the the behind the scenes things like all the times i messed up so i always try and work like bloopers and stuff into it yeah you know what's funny too is uh there was a point in time in which i thought i had to kind of like have an announcer voice um and i still i would still say that i i try to have a presentable presentation mm -hmm. um when I make the show, but there was a point in time where I was just like, Hey, what's up everybody? You know, that kind of, um, and th that was like a huge complaint that like, again, majority of people are going to like it and that's great. But if you really want to capture as many people as possible, consider the fact that when there's a subset of 15 people, uh, honest enough to say like, man, I really wish that he would talk like a normal human being, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Consider it, you know, what, what damage would it really do to the channel to, to, uh, you know, to adhere to that, you know, yep. to, to take that criticism and apply it. And, um, so that's why like my presentation now is very much like try, try not to sound robotic, uh, and just try to convey the information as a person who respects the information to a degree and also show that there's a human side to you, you know, but like, uh, don't overextend the human side either. <laughs> there is a balance. No, dude, like your your content's so easily digestible. So I uh, I spend ninety percent of my day by myself at my job. So I like to um, like build a playlist or whatever, and I can just turn your videos on and let them play over and over, like you know, just the next one, and the next one, while I'm driving around for my job. And oh my god! Yeah, like... you're the best kind of fan. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, find, like you said, finding that balance because I thought that, you know, when I first thought about, you know, making videos, I thought I was going to have to be this like overly hyped, excited person until I started finding content like yours where you're not the, the over the top, you know, you know, screaming in people's ears. Like I thought that that, I almost thought that that was required like to, to find people <laughs> but uh no it's, it's a it's great definitely... way to it's a great way to capture a young audience yeah because they're they're naive enough to just kind of immerse themselves into your performance mm -hmm. um but adults will will probably take problem with it you know um 
that's all I could say on that. I don't want to offend anybody that goes that route, but you can certainly find well, YouTubers that are just like, "Hey, what's up, everybody?" You know, they're like, "Today we're gonna go into the sand pit." Whoa! You know, and it works. It works yeah. on children, though. There's no way that a 35 year old man is like, "I like this." You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so again, it, it depends on what audience you're placating to, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Well, we are uh, we're coming up on that hour mark, so uh, you want to you know throw your content out there. Like, where can people find you? And uh, you know, oh sure, yeah. Um, you can type in "boundary break" on the YouTube search engine. Guarantee it's right above the video you're watching right now, mm -hmm. and uh, my show will pop up. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> until someone better than me rolls around and starts putting that in their titles and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that becomes not true anymore. Um, no, but yeah, seriously, type in Boundary Break and your favorite game. I've done over 105 episodes at this point, so there is a solid chance that whatever game you decide to put into that search engine, that or something similar will pop up and see if it's for you. That's awesome. And there will be links to your YouTube and Twitter down in the description of this video, too. So make sure you guys go over and check it out if you never have, which it's hard to think that people haven't because, like, the people that I talked to were like, really, you're, you know, you're you're going to talk to him? Really? That's awesome. And, like, uh, my my friend Tony, he's like, he, he knew exactly, like, when I said she says, he knew exactly who I was talking to. So, no, but definitely go check out Boundary Break and uh you know check out the videos they're awesome it's really cool to Thank see you. outside the outside the boundaries of what the creators normally wanted you to see <laughs> no i appreciate that thank you and uh thank you for coming on the show of course it was a pleasure <laughs> and uh i guess until next time maybe we can get you back on the show some other time so sure i mean i'm <laughs> I'm not saying this just to say that I, I really, I, I mean, you already know that I'm going on vacation soon. Yep. So, yeah, so it's going to be a very busy schedule, but I would love to come back at some point. Cool. Well, until next time, I suppose I will talk to you later. And uh, everybody else, make sure you go down in the description. I know it's hard to scroll an inch and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all, the, all of uh, the links will be down there. So Awesome. So I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with She Says as much as I did. It was a lot of fun, and it was awesome to get to talk to him. Once again, thank you for checking the show out. Make sure you leave a like and a comment. Uh, subscribe for more episodes of this. If you want to be on the show, make sure you reach out. Make sure you check out the description for links to all of She Says' content. And go over and subscribe to his channel. He's got a lot of great videos. So until next time, I'll catch you later.